Uh, I just started recording and uh, so I thank you very much, uh, Ovidio and uh, uh, I mean, uh, University uh, of Bucharest for inviting me and your department, of course, for inviting me to give uh, uh, a talk. Uh, the original plan was different because I should come to visit you, but unfortunately uh, it wasn't possible uh, uh, this spring and uh, it was also uh, not that safe uh, to come uh, to come now in autumn. So uh, uh, that's definitely a compromise. But I'm of course very happy uh, to have this opportunity too. Uh, today I'm going to give you uh, a talk on uh, uh, empty scale project, which is, which which is a. Um, a relatively old project because it's roughly uh, 15 years that I'm working uh, on and uh, uh, today I will uh, first of all uh, give you a short introduction on uh, uh, the empty scapes project on the one hand and from the other also generally speaking on uh, Mediterranean landscape archaeology uh, a sort of historical uh, framework and uh, uh, development, then um, the development of the project, because I mean, we didn't, I mean, the project has a, a pretty long uh, development. We didn't um, test and apply new methods and new technology uh, just by chance, I would say, but is, uh, is a process. And uh, um, I will focus on uh, one of the case studies, the case study is, is, is about Roselle. Uh, Roselle is uh, uh, an Etruscan and Roman city uh, in, uh, uh, in central Italy, so is roughly 200 kilometers north from Rome uh, and is very next to the Tyrrhenian coast, uh, so on the western side of Italy. Um, I will talk about this case study starting from what we, uh, as you can see, I mean, outcomes of phase one, two, and three. Uh, different phases are connected to different approaches. So, phase one was based on field walking uh, survey. Uh, phase two was mainly based on uh, uh, remote sensing. And phase three uh, was based on uh, uh, archaeological excavation based on the results of the previous two phases. Uh, so, targeted archaeological excavation. And then some general remarks and uh, outcomes. Uh, and of course, as already a video uh, told you, uh, a question time. Well, here you can see some uh, also some uh, covers of uh, some of the most recent publications. So, on, on this project, uh, uh, so, the first one is uh, a paper that I published in 2017 uh, on antiquity and uh, uh, the other three are a cover of books. So, there is a monography, as you can see, published by Springer, mapping the archaeological continuum. And then there is, uh, uh, let's say, an edited book by me and Maurizio Forte on digital method and remote sensing, where there is a paper on, uh, uh, on the same case study I'm talking about now, today. And then another case study is about Vey, which is another uh, uh, very important and uh, old city in Italy. Uh, this was the probably some of you know about. However, Vey was, uh, let's say, the, the most important, the biggest Etruscan city. And it's also pretty interesting because Vey is 15 kilometers from Rome. So, was, uh, uh, there was a big challenge between Rome and Vey. However, um, now let's start from uh, uh, a general overview of Mediterranean landscape archaeology. Um, landscape archaeology in the Mediterranean is relatively recent uh, because for a very long time architecture and urbanism uh, focused the attention of uh, the archaeologists and the researchers. Uh, and by contrast, sites and landscape features uh, outside uh, uh, ancient urban centers were less frequently investigated. 
So we need to wait for the end of World War II to uh, start a new interest uh, uh, in, in landscape studies. Um, from the end of World War II, we had what uh, uh, some, uh, some scholars define the first wave of uh, 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 landscape studies. So it is more or less between uh, uh, 1950 and 1970, and uh, uh, some of the most important experience uh, in Italy, for instance, is connected with the work of the uh, uh, British School at Rome, uh, directed by uh, Ward Perkins. And uh, uh, another very important study, case study, was the Minnesota Messina expedition. Uh, but this, this happened in Greece, not, not in, uh, uh, in Italy, of course, and some others. However, uh, those experiences uh, uh, have in common that uh, um, are aimed, and uh, I would say that from the historical and archaeological point of view, the main uh, objective of landscape studies was to contextualize urban centers. So. Uh, studies were focused for a very long time, as I told you previously, on urban areas, uh, and, uh, uh, but not uh, on the landscape around, where lots of resources came. So, uh, the aim was to contextualize, to better understand what was around uh, uh, urban centers. And um, uh, this was, of course, I mean, topography uh, research based, that means that one of the uh, very important thing was that, the, that the, this was based on field work. So they uh, did field walking uh, or in any case uh, uh, field research and uh, people spend a lot of time on, on the field, of course. And let's say uh, particular importance was given to uh, the largest uh, uh, settlements sanctuaries or battlefields, so big cities, uh, uh, sorry, big sites, um, and methodology. So methodology was pretty intuitive because everything was at the beginning. Uh, now, starting from um, 1970 up to roughly uh, the end of the century, we have what has been say what has been called the second wave uh, second wave is uh, uh, based on uh, um, a much more uh, uh, developed uh, uh, methodology so uh, close order feed walking for instance uh, and uh, uh, recording of sites uh, as well not, not just big sites but any kind of site and uh, 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 off-sites too, uh, much more uh, sophisticated procedures and the development of methodology is definitely a part of this uh, pretty long period. And another, let's say, characteristic is that uh, the overall uh, extent of survey areas is going to be reduced, to shrink. Um, it is more or less what happened with archaeological excavation. So the more um, the methodology is accurate, the more the, the methodology is detailed, the smaller uh, uh, the areas that are going to be excavated are. So uh, it's a matter of scale, uh, substantially. Um, now, at the end of uh, uh, the second uh, the second wave, um, the most important scholars started also a sort of critical review. So, and um, here you can see four covers uh, of some of the most important uh, books written on uh, uh, on the review of what they did in the last uh, roughly 20, 30 years. And uh, there are lots of, uh, um, I mean, common ideas coming from uh, uh, all those experiences. And 
some of them are summarized in these slides. So, all the scholars, or most of them, uh, agree that um, uh, fieldwork and, uh, let's say, uh, um, archaeological research was too much based on field walking. Um, moreover, uh, they realized that they need to improve non-destructive techniques uh, to collect uh, uh, information. And uh, moreover, they also realized that they need to recover, to collect a wider range of material, for instance, ecofacts, not just pottery, not just artifacts, but also um, other, uh, other kind of evidence that could um, allow them not just to, uh, for instance, identify or uh, develop scenarios about settlements, but also about the, the transformation of the environment and, uh, uh, and the landscape, indeed. Um, moreover, um, I mean, this critical review took place uh, at the end of the last century. So, of course, I mean, at that time, uh, personal computers, so digital technologies and, and spatial technologies were also um, starting. Uh, and there was lots of, uh, uh, let's say, optimism from this point of view. So, I mean, what, what they realized, of course, that they need much more uh, support from what? Of course, from GIS, for instance, that was, uh, I mean, at the early beginning. And uh, another, I mean, for spatial technology, uh, another point that was very, very important was uh, GPS, for instance. I mean, um, this is something that uh, uh, you definitely need. I mean, if you do if you do feed walking and you need to uh, to get the, the 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 correct position of uh, your site, and if you want to do any kind of intrasite uh, um, uh, analysis, so to map where some uh, kind of concentration, so association of different materials, and so on. Um, another, uh, let's say, uh, point um, that could be interesting is uh, uh, some of them, some of those scholars, and particularly John Bintliff, started also thinking in terms of uh, continuity instead of uh, a finite number of sites. So uh, they started uh, thinking that it was, to a certain extent, wrong just thinking about sites, but it was much better to think about uh, in terms of um, surface uh, or even better uh, of concentration, so of density of evidence. Um, density means that there is no gaps, because uh, you can have very, very low density, but you still have some sort of density, so one shared four square kilometer is a density in any case. So it means that that landscape is not empty. Uh, that area is not empty. However, now let's see, let's move from, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the big scenarios of what uh, scholars did in the Mediterranean area uh, to <coughs> our experience at the University of Siena. So the experience, uh, uh, exploring landscapes uh, in Siena started around uh, uh, the end of the first wave and the beginning of the second wave. So I'm talking about roughly the early um, early 70s. And um, at that time, um, in particular, uh, my professor Ricardo Frankovic uh, started his activity in uh, in Tuscany, and uh, uh, during uh, um, roughly 20, 25 years, uh, uh, so the whole second wave, let's say, uh, has been uh, identified something like 20,000 uh, sites that were previously unknown. And uh, this activity allow us, I mean, to develop uh, a completely uh, uh, new uh, 
settlement uh, patterns scenario from prehistory to the medieval period. Well, here those uh, covers, book covers, are uh, archaeological maps and uh, uh, some, I mean, books uh, uh, about methodology and uh, books about, um, I'm sorry, and books about um, the development of uh, historical models in uh, Tuscany and uh, uh, in Europe too. Um, however, I was saying, um, we also did a critical review, and uh, we identified two uh, critical points. So we focused on two critical points. So one issue was empty spaces. Uh, uh, because in uh, uh, some areas that we uh, explored very, very carefully and for a very long time, uh, there was still lots of uh, absence of evidence. And the, the problem from our point of view was, of course, I mean, that data are missing, but uh, what is really missing there is also relationships between, uh, um, uh, between evidence in the landscape. So you will better understand what I mean by relationships, but uh, I'm talking about physical relationships. So I'm talking about um, um, the kind of relationship that we have when we do archaeological excavation. So overlapping or uh, uh, cutting, or in any case, uh, physical relation between uh, relationships between layers, between evidence. So another issue is uh, that some empty spaces were uh, not, let's say, um, uh, well distributed, I would say. So, uh, for instance, uh, we got some, uh, we, 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 have, we have a very big issue in the Mediterranean, but I would say that almost generally speaking, this is, this is an issue in archaeology. So, woodland. Woodland is a sort of black hole. We, we don't have almost any evidence about uh, what is in woodland, because most of our uh, um, methodology just don't work in woodland areas. And uh, you should also consider that woodland in, uh, in the Mediterranean area is particularly dense and difficult to be explored. So sometimes it's, it's, it's really impossible just to, to get in. In any case, there is uh, overall uh, missing of representativeness in our uh, in our patterns in our results. Um, another issue was so empty spaces, and another issue is empty phases. Um, what I mean by that, I mean that, as you can see from this uh, diagram, uh, ninety-five percent of our uh, evidence. So I'm talking about 20,000 sites. So it's, it's definitely a representative, a representative sample. Um, so 95% belong to the Etruscan and the Roman period, which means um, more or less uh, sixth century uh, before Common Era and uh, uh, sixth century uh, of the Common Era. So 12 centuries. Uh, but just the 5% belong to the prehistoric times and the protohistoric times, of course. And uh, uh, the same 5%, so it's 2% is uh, medieval times. This was definitely a big issue for several reasons. One of them is that, um, I mean, we, we study landscapes across time, but we were particularly interested in late antiquity and early Middle Age. Uh, which was so difficult to find, so difficult to find any kind of evidence. Um, so, from the point of view of the different sources, uh, the 20,000 sites has been mainly identified by field walking survey, uh, some of them by vertical area photography, existing archaeological knowledge and documentary sources. But a very large part of them, 
So but a bit less than the 70% come from field walking survey. So what we uh, thought at the time was, so if, I mean, field walking survey is so important for us, let's go through a critical review of also of field walking. And uh, here you can see advantages and, th and disadvantages of field walking. So very quickly, quickly, um, of course, I mean, uh, field walking is very significant for exploring plow zones, uh, but not that good for uh, uh, woodland or grazing lands and so on. Uh, it's cheap, it's quick and relatively non-destructive. Uh, it provides us chronological information and is flexible from the point of view of the uh, scale. So uh, as a research method, so it's possible, I mean, to explore uh, pretty large areas. So it's possible to work at national level. It takes time, but it's possible. And, but at the same time, it's possible to work at the micro scale. So uh, in doing grid collection and uh, uh, improving, let's say, I, to a certain extent, the resolution of uh, uh, the method. However, there are also limitations. And uh, for instance, in the past, now it's pretty different, but in the past, it was not that um, uh, easy or it was not for granted, I mean, to talk about the limitation of field walking survey because uh, most of the people were just doing field walking survey and they were basing all their uh, um, activity and, and, and uh, uh, um, historical narrative on field walking data sets. So, however, there are some limitations that we need to take into account. So the depth of the, of the evidence uh, so is limited. Uh, generally, uh, is pretty difficult. I mean, to get, or you need some special condition. I mean, to get information on deposits that are deeper than one meter. Uh, and reliability of the interpretation. This is a very important issue because um, um, before I quoted uh, War Perkins and the experience of the um, uh, of the South Etruria project I, I, I quoted before, um, this, that was one of the project belong one of the most important project belonging to the first wave uh, in Italy. Um, what has been published by Tim Potter, uh, let's say the first um, overview on. Uh, 20 years uh, of agricultural research, uh, Tim Potter said, guys, the time for field walking is over. Because when they started in the 50s, uh, deposits were just um, uh, uh, brought to the surface, uh, so destroyed, but brought to the surface uh, for the first time. Now, after 20 years plowing, uh, it is so difficult to interpret properly uh, uh, archaeology that is on the surface. So that's happened in the, uh, at the end of the 70s. Uh, of course, we are still doing uh, field walking and uh, uh, um, sometimes even with good results, but we need to take it into account that now is uh, around 70 years that uh, Uh, yes, of course. Um, it is roughly 70 years that uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, that I mean, in the countryside, uh, uh, fields have been plowed and uh, the deposits are getting poorer and poorer and the uh, shares are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so, and, and, and reliability of data interpretation means that I would say, in my experience, that it is difficult, let's say, not to recognize a Roman villa. So it's not, it's, it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's almost impossible, I would say. A Roman villa is still easily recognizable. But if we are talking about a small uh, house, uh, a small um, country house uh, where just a family was living, uh, uh, with uh, uh, poor uh, uh, stratification, uh, it, I, I think it's very, very difficult to recognize. I mean, if it's 80 years or 70 years that has been plowed and uh, shares are uh, 
uh, on the surface uh, uh, getting uh, very hot weather in the summer, very cold in the winter, and so on. Um, however, uh, recognize uh, a short range of evidence. Yeah, is that's that's another issue. So uh, you are plenty of uh, Roman villas. You have, we are plenty of uh, small houses, mid-sized houses, but uh, there are not really, let's say. Uh, any kind of typology uh, or any possibility to distinguish among them. Uh, and if you uh, give a look to um, an archaeological map at the end, I mean, the range and uh, the range of evidence is, is pretty limited. Uh, is, is, um, we are missing a lot of information uh, also from this point of view. Another very big issue was material culture. So uh, we realized uh, uh that some specific features uh were not visible and uh, all those features could be uh, uh identified as negative evidence um and negative negative evidence is uh, is a lot of archaeology so <laughs> about all um if you think about some cultures which uh, don't use bricks for the cover of the roof, which uh, are using uh, uh, perishable materials um, and maybe are using pottery uh, of poor quality. So at the end, uh, the result is that you find uh, almost nothing or very, very few evidence. Um, and this was very important for us because it explained pretty clearly why we got all those good results from the 6th uh, century BC uh, to the 6th century AD. Because, I mean, the Etruscan and Roman period are based on a material culture that is, uh, uh, is, is very durable. Um, pottery is of extremely good quality. And uh, both cultures are using uh, a lot of stones and bricks uh, for uh, the roof. So it was very easy to recognize that kind of periods. But for the prehistory and protohistory and early Middle Age, when uh, the material culture changed completely, so for instance, uh, before, so uh, uh, sorry, uh, prehistory and protohistory and uh, uh, early Middle Age, you don't have any tiles for covering the roof which is really a lot of evidence that you are missing. Uh, the quality of uh, the... Uh, you, you don't have stones, for instance, for, build, uh, for building uh, uh, walls. Uh, you have, they, they are just using perishable material in most of the cases. And also the pottery, is the, the quality is not that good. So those periods are virtually invisible using uh, uh, um, field walking based uh, research. Now, what we did that, uh, at that time, so uh, for several reasons, we, um, we got in touch with uh, uh, some British colleagues and we started implementing aerial survey um, using light aircrafts. And this was very important because uh, we got immediately some very, very interesting results. Uh, we got the opportunity to find uh, uh, still Roman villas, big Roman villas, as you can see, maybe small, but however, um, this is a huge Roman villas, plenty of different um, um, rooms uh, and with uh, a, a pretty important articulation. But we also got the opportunity to find negative evidence. Uh, we started finding, for instance, field systems that were invisible, I mean, to see uh, uh, in um, uh, doing field walking. And we started also to find some evidence that were totally unknown. This uh, triple uh, round ditch uh, uh, evidence is, is a medieval mound. Um, we we did some field walking and we found some uh, very, very clear evidence of uh, belonging to the early Middle Age. This is a site uh, 
sizing uh, one hectare. And, you know, the very important point, I mean, this was absolutely important um, and was telling us that we were on the right way uh, because um, after uh, roughly 30, 35 years research, uh, and this research was strongly based on uh, uh, hilltop uh, uh, villages during the Middle Age and the uh, the, the so-called uh, um, uh, process of incastellamento, so uh, the, 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 the development, the implementation of castles uh, all around Tuscany. So this was very, very important because um, up to uh, that time, so up to when we found this site, uh, medieval mounds were totally totally unknown in Tuscany and we're totally unknown just because we were using the wrong approach so just because we were not using uh, uh, um, enough aerial archaeology and uh, in any case methods that are very very balanced from the point of view of the capability to recognize positive and negative evidence however this was a very important point for us now uh, you could think, well, I mean, if you find your method, uh, if you find a way to see uh, uh, also uh, um, easily by uh, uh, aerial photography, what you're looking for, that's good. You don't need anything else. Unfortunately, it's not exactly like that because, as you know, I mean, aerial photography works extremely good when it works. So, I mean... Um, that sometimes works, so sometimes evidence are visible. Well, here, I, I don't know if you can see uh, if it's good enough, but however, in this picture, uh, well, just a while, I need to. Uh, I can. can you see my, uh, 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 my arrow? Yes. Okay, okay, yes. that's good. So, uh, my, my cursor. So uh, here we have uh, uh, the evidence of uh, the very big Roman villa I showed with you previously. And here you can see uh, uh, the detail, let's say. And this picture has been taken in tw uh, 2005, uh, and the, the, the evidence was extremely uh, visible. I mean, very, very detailed. Uh, Two years later, we went in the same area, we did the, the, the aerial survey in the same area, and we expected to, uh, to see again the evidence, but, but the evidence was not there. So it was totally invisible. Uh, so this is a phenomenon that is pretty well known, I mean, connected with aerial photography, that notwithstanding, I mean, there is the same kind of cultivation. Uh, and you go there, I mean, to you do your survey at the right time, so when uh, the crop is uh, ripening and is, uh, the visibility is at its best, um, for some reasons connected to, I mean, uh, uh, the rain, uh, um, the range of the rain that year, or, or the, 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 some, some environmental condition, connected also to the geology and so on, maybe it's not visible. Uh, it happens that there are crop marks that are visible once and that are totally invisible for 30 years. So, um, what I'm saying is that aerial photography is an extremely powerful and useful method, but uh, the only strategy is uh, um, to have lots of time. Uh, you, need, uh, you need to implement this method over uh, 20, 30, 50 years, as it happens, for instance, in the UK, uh, as it happens in other countries, which is fine. But, I mean, if you are a veterinary and you would like to get some faster results, um, you should integrate uh, aerial photography with other uh, methodologies. So and that's what we did. So we started uh, doing uh, geophysics, and particularly we started um, using magnetic survey. 
uh, to survey sites that we already identified by, um, by field walking survey or that we identified by other sources of information. Um, well, this is a very big site that we um, surveyed in uh, 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 next to Grosseto, so next to Roselle, uh, along the Tyrrhenian coast. Uh, that's a very big uh, Roman villa with different phases, uh, and that is, I mean, the site is still there also in the early Middle Ages. Um, not that far, so a few hundred of meters. We also found another mound. Uh, this is also interesting because, I mean, it's, it's like, I, I say, I, I like to say that it's like mushrooms. So when you find one, there are, uh, uh, and, and you understand, I mean, where it's possible to find it, uh, uh, you start finding many more. And um, that's what happened with, uh, uh, um, with uh, medieval mounds. However, so as you can see here, we, uh, well, first of all, we, we surveyed, this is uh, roughly four hectares. Uh, we, uh, we did, uh, I'm sorry. So we, um, uh, we did the survey integrating uh, uh, um, ERT, magnetic, GPR, electromagnetic survey. So we applied all the methods roughly. Um, uh, satellite imagery and uh, uh, aerial photography. And uh, I mean, we integrated all those information and uh, we got this, we got this drawing. So, which is the, uh, the overall result. And then uh, uh, consider there was also the mound not that far from this site. We also uh, thought that could be interesting and useful to connect the two sites and to see if there was something that we missed. And indeed, there was some uh, road system, paleo channel uh, that were uh, uh, in between. Um, now, we also uh, started from 2005 uh, to collect some LiDAR data. As I told you, um, woodland particularly are a big issue, so a, a big black hole in our record. And, uh, so we, we, we started collecting LiDAR data, but the, the real problem in our case was that uh, we got some results, but a bit um, less than we expected because uh, the density of the canopy, of the Mediterranean canopy is very, very high. And uh, the resolution of the data that we got was not enough. Uh, we definitely need to improve resolution and I'm not going to talk about this today, but uh, at present, I mean, the solution in this area in, uh, to, to overcome uh, uh, this kind of canopy is using uh, LiDAR uh, uh, on a drone platform. So uh, LiDAR that uh, where it's possible to collect 200 points per uh, square meter, 400 points, and so on. Uh, so we need very, very high resolution to, to get uh, good results, which is a problem to a certain extent, because it means that you need to, you, you, you can collect very large areas uh, for several reasons, uh, because it's pretty complicated to manage all those data, because it's, of course, it's time consuming and, exp and, and, and very, very um, expensive. However, let's move to uh, empty scapes. Uh, so the two main uh, sample areas, as you can see here, well, this is central Italy area, you have Rome. Uh, Veio is one of the sample uh, area and uh, Roselle and Grosseto is the sample area we are talking about now. Um, well, here you see uh, more or less, I mean, the, the approach that we applied, of course, I mean, we are still using the traditional approach to archaeological uh, landscape studies, which I mean is based on uh, literary, documentary sources, iconography, and so on. Uh, we are also still practicing and doing field walking. Um, but of course, I mean, remote sensing is, has played a very important uh, role uh, using uh, different kinds of sensors, but mainly. Uh, let's say, 
and the most uh, important one, uh, uh, I would say, is definitely the magnetic survey. Uh, we collected up to now uh, roughly 800, 850 hectares um, uh, magnetic data. Uh, another very important approach is based on geoarchaeology. Um, I don't think it's possible to, to do any landscape study without involving geoarchaeology. It's so important, I mean, to, to, to understand uh, the transformation of the landscape, uh, um, to better understand where, for instance, uh, uh, the depth of uh, the stratification is, 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 is too high and, I mean, uh, is totally useless so if you, I mean, to go there and, uh, and, do, and, and apply some method or do some surveys or at the same time is, is very important to, uh, to get further information on, yeah, the use and the transformation of landscape naturally or by anthropic uh, intervention. Uh, Bioarchaeology is also is also particularly important. Uh, is 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 that's another uh, very very big area of uh, application. However, what we did up to now is mainly based on uh, pollen analysis and uh, um, and the analysis of skeletons, so uh, paleopathology and so on. Uh, another very important issue. And a very important point was for us uh, archaeological excavation. And it was pretty interesting because, I mean, before starting archaeological excavation and, 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 and minimalist test excavation, I was, to be fair, very, very satisfied from the overall results we got just through uh, remote sensing. But when you start excavating, I mean, is I mean, is, is a new chapter. It's something completely new that you get. Uh, and. Uh, uh, um, is like uh, opening a completely, uh, I mean, a new door on uh, on something totally new. And we got information that we couldn't get in any case uh, from remote sensing or from uh, other other methods. Um, okay. Well, here you see a picture of the, the area. This is Roselle, so this is the area of the old city. Uh, here we have another important settlement that as, uh, I mean, a, a prehistoric phase and a medieval phase. And uh, here on the background, you see the modern city of Grosseto. And this is uh, the landscape that we uh, surveyed in the last 13 years. Um, well, here you see what we knew uh, after or at the end of the second wave. Um, I'm talking about, as you can see, so uh, 1977, 206. <clears throat> so in this area, we got 30 years of traditional approaches in the study of the landscape, so little resources and so on. Uh, 30 years feed walking survey and uh, uh, 20 years vertical aerial photography. So vertical aerial photography, I'm pretty sure that you know the difference uh, So between vertical and oblique. It is not just a matter of uh, point of view. Uh, vertical aerial photography are taken not for archaeology. So our pictures are aerial photographies that are taken for different purposes, mainly of technical mapping. So, mainly of technical mapping. Um, and the red spots are uh, the areas that has been identified through uh, all those uh, activities. And um, now, just a while. Well, here you see the overall results that we achieved in the last 13 years. Uh, summarizing, as you can see, so 12 seasons of exploratory area survey, uh, 60 hours of exploratory area survey by drone, and uh, uh, roughly, so eight, now, now is a bit more, so is uh, 850 hectares of geophysics. Uh, of course, I mean, you, you can see any detail, but I mean, it's, uh, I think it's pretty, uh, is, is, is pretty evident, I mean, the how lots of 
uh, gaps has been filled by uh, applying this uh, all those methods and this strategy. Uh, now let's move into the detail. Here we are pretty next to uh, Roselle, so next to the uh, Roman and Etruscan city. Here you see uh, so contour lines and some uh, yellow spots uh, showing areas where we found evidence uh, through, let's say, the traditional approach. And here you see uh, some magnetic maps and here you see the mapping of the evidence. Um, so we have an incredible increase in evidence. Um, different colors are connected to different, uh, of course, uh, interpretation. Here we have another uh, medieval mound, so a double ditch enclosure that was uh, not visible previously with some possible uh, buildings or uh, in any case, evidence inside. Um, here, for instance, we have uh, this evidence that this is a, a road system, and all those um, uh, brown lines are has been interpreted as a field system. Well, and many other evidence that you can see here too. Um, well, we started doing some boreal survey, uh, which uh, allow us to uh, better understand some uh, peculiarity of this area, but which didn't allow us exactly, let's say, to um, to verify or to better understand uh, to better understand the deposits. Um, it was very, very useful, for instance, to do a grid collection in this area and to uh, redo uh, our field walking survey. Um, here you see, I mean, the density uh, map of the evidence. And here it's possible to see the, um, the chronological range. So uh, we have few evidence starting from late and the early late antiquity uh, and uh, most of them most of the evidence as you can see is uh, uh, dark gray uh, dark green sorry uh, belong to the uh, 10 up to the 12th century ad uh, which correspond pretty clearly with the medieval mound um, this was very interesting and also uh, very peculiar uh, because it was totally unexpected um, to find so many evidence of uh, belonging to the Middle Age uh, so next to a Roman and Etruscan city. So, I mean, the rule, what would happen everywhere, uh, at least in Tuscany or in, in Etruria, uh, if you are doing field walking next to a big Etruscan Roman city, you would collect uh, a huge amount of Etruscan and Roman pottery, a huge amount. Uh, here is pretty interesting because we don't find any, almost any, uh, very, very few shares of, um, of Etruscan and Roman pottery. But we found a lot of medieval uh, evidence, medieval shirts. Um, so it is absolutely uh, surprising. So we, 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 we don't have an explanation for that. Uh, we didn't have an explanation for that. However, uh, we will come back talking about this uh, later on. Um, this is another detail. Uh, here you see a part of the uh, city of Roselle in yellow. And here's some other evidence. Uh, and here you see uh, the magnetic map, uh, which is plenty of evidence. So you see this uh, round evidence, pretty big. Uh, you can see, for instance, this linear evidence um, and many other round evidence along this uh, uh, linear evidence. Um, moreover, in this area where is it uh, we are here so we are here and here you can see the detail of another 
uh, interesting evidence, uh, which is uh, almost square uh, uh, anomaly with uh, uh, a double round uh, anomaly uh, inscribed. However, here you see the mapping. Uh, this was also pretty exciting because uh, so we, what we found here is uh, uh, a road system, a major one, uh, which is uh, uh, going to uh, the city. So this is the west uh, road connecting the city with the landscape. And along the road, this was plenty of round barrows, uh, up to 40 round barrows. Um, one of them, uh, well, I mean, the biggest is 42 meters diameter and the smallest is 14 meters. So, um, a funerary landscape, so a monumental uh, uh, landscape connected with tombs, uh, which find uh, um, amazing parallel with uh, uh, other Etruscan cities. So, with Vey, for instance, uh, Cerveteri and um, uh, Bulci. Um, but this was almost completely invisible. Uh, I mean, oh, this was invisible on the ground. Uh, just in the last field walking, we found some um, uh, some some evidence that could potentially uh, be connected with uh, uh, with uh, this this landscape and all those evidence. Um, well, now let's move to. Uh, archaeological landscape excavation. So in 2017, uh, 18 and 19, we started excavating. Uh, this year we didn't for uh, also for the COVID, but not just for the COVID, because I mean, the overall idea was also to spend some time to work on the data. And um, here you see the areas where we uh, did our work. So. Uh, the, area that I, the, 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 the area that I show with you, with the big mound and uh, the field system and the road system, and two areas here next to the Ayali, so the very big side that I showed you previously. So the other mound and the field system. Um, so, um, well, here you see uh, my team. Um, we are, as you can see, we are not a lot, so it's a, it's a relatively small team. Um, all the uh, students and, and archaeologists are definitely important, but let's say that the, the mechanical excavator is particularly important because the soil is very hard and uh, it takes too much time, I mean, to, uh, to do it without. Uh, well, here you can see some... Uh, some example of the kind of the work that we did. So we did uh, uh, test excavations, so trenches, but also, uh, as you can uh, see previously on uh, uh, on the top right, uh, we also did a large, a pretty large area excavation, <coughs> which allow us to uh, uh, identify and excavate a pretty big uh, uh, Lombard necropolis. Uh, cemetery. So, altogether, we did 20 test excavations and one open area. Um, for altogether, is uh, uh, 2,000 <coughs> linear meters for the trenches and uh, 600 square meters for the large the open area excavation. Um, now, let's move to uh, the first area I show with you, so that one that is next to the city, we did some tests into uh, the mound and some tests outside to test, uh, uh, let's say, to try to test by typology the different kind of evidence, or some of them at least. Um, here, immediately outside, we did uh, a pretty deep test excavation <coughs> and this was um, mainly aimed to better understand the uh, geological transformation, so the geomorphological transformation of the area. 
Um, this was very interesting because we found that, well, the first layer was, I mean, uh, uh, the topsoil, so the, the, the agricultural horizon. And then immediately after, number one, this is uh, this start from um, late antiquity to the Middle Age. So this is uh, um, a medieval paleosoil, very well defined, uh, plenty of evidence. So there is pottery. Uh, we also got charcoal, and uh, we did carbon dating, and uh, immediately. Uh, after so below we have number three and number three is uh, um is clay is blue clay and this was very interesting for us because geomorphologists told us that those kind of clay could um uh, happen just where there is still water um we did some other test excavation here, uh, uh, area 2000, and we found exactly the same pattern. So we got the topsoil, we got uh, the, the medieval, late antique and medieval paleosoil, and we found then uh, the, uh, the dark clay layer. And uh, we did uh, radiocar some radiocarbon dating, and um, now, um, so the first one, uh, this one, so this dating, uh, so 670 and uh, 777 was connected with uh, this big lens of Chaco. So that means that this lens is uh, early Middle Age is beginning of early middle age and we also got some some charcoal some sample from uh, the the clay layer and this was the result so uh, the 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 clay layer started at least or, or was there um, from the sixth century bc so or before common era, <coughs> and stop roughly in late antiquity. Um, so then we did also a test excavation next to the road system, and uh, we found the road system, but we also found um, an embankment. So it was not just a road system, but uh, this was something uh more i would say so we found uh, uh, uh roughly i mean just to explain you uh, a thing like that so this was built by uh, gravels and uh, here and on the top we got the the road and the road bed um next to the road um almost here and to be fair i mean we didn't say uh, we didn't see sorry uh, we didn't see uh those evidence from uh, uh, the magnetic or uh, all our non-destructive analysis that we did previously uh we identified the cemetery by chance i mean looking for the uh, when we did the test excavation to identify and to test uh, the road system, we found the first grave, uh, the two first graves, and then we, uh, uh, it was very interesting so for us, and we continued excavating those, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, cemetery. Well, here you can see some, um, uh, some pictures uh, of the graves, uh, uh, there was also goods, uh, and uh, that's a grave of a child with uh, uh, a nice uh, belt. Um, and here we also found some evidence of settlement in the same area. This was based on, uh, on, on magnetic evidence. Uh, 
So, I mean, summarizing, uh, putting together uh, different uh, information, what we got here. So, um, thanks to test excavation, uh, we realized that in this area, you see the blue area, uh, we got uh, a humid area or a pond. Uh, it was very easy, let's say, to do um, uh, to do it uh, um, to build uh, a pond in this area or to get it for natural events. Uh, because here we have a river, and uh, I mean the geomorphologist told us that the river should go this way, not uh, in between uh, Mosconcina and Moscona, that are two uh, hills. Um, however, this river could move uh, uh, between Mosconcina and Moscona for natural reasons, or could be moved by uh, the builders of the cities of the, who was managing the landscape. However, in any case, uh, we, have the evidence, we have evidence that in this area we got uh, a pond, a humid area of roughly 33, 35 hectares uh, that started in the 6th century uh, BC and uh, has been partially stopped, uh, has been partially reclaimed uh, um, during late antiquity. Um, so, in any case, uh, you can ask why, I mean, you need a pond and, uh, next to a city. Well, this is a very, very interesting resource because a pond means fish, uh, a pond means uh, um, uh, birds. Uh, so, there is, it, we, could, uh, we could do a parallel with a, with a sort of fridge. So, is, uh, um, is, is a big resource for uh, uh, food very next to the city. Um, and the, it was definitely useful because uh, during, I mean, starting from the 6th century up to the 6th century BC, uh, for 12th century, this humid area has been kept, so it was there, and uh, nobody reclaimed when uh, the city was a very important city and i mean there was absolutely no difficult for them from the technical point of view uh, uh, to reclaim this area so that means that was useful and that they needed um, um well this is based on some evidence i mean the, the border uh, the northern border of the area is based on uh, uh, the presence of a roman villa almost next to the uh, not that far, I mean, from the place where we did the, the, the first test excavation. And, um, and yeah, as I told you, I mean, the, 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 those uh, um, interpretations are based on, on rather carbon dating. And um, what happened is that at a certain point, so during the late antiquity, uh, this part, the gray one, has been reclaimed. And uh, this is based on, uh, uh, of course, on the evidence coming from uh, a test excavation and um, also from the embankment that we found uh, <coughs> through test excavation and that is dated at uh, 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 around the 6th century. And, uh, and also from the, from the cemetery. Of course, I mean, you are not going to, to build a, a cemetery in in a, in, a, in a pond or in in a swamp area. Uh, you need to dry the area. I mean to do that. Um, and uh, this area uh, has been uh, uh, still a pond from the sixth century up to the ninth, tenth century um, uh, um, of the common era. So uh, we have. The first part has been reclaimed, and the second part has been reclaimed at, uh, during the Middle Age. Um, then, well, here we have some evidence that the road has been abandoned during the Middle Age because we have some uh, channels and some um, some field boundaries that are cutting the uh, the road. 
and um, and here we have the overall uh, and the final uh, result. So the reclaimed area. Um, here we are in uh, the lower part. As you can see, also in this area, we collected a lot of evidence and we found lots of field systems uh, and many other um, evidence. Uh, again, you see the here you have the uh, yellow dots, the yellow evidence. So what we knew previously and what we know now. Um, now, from this point of view, a very important point is to understand that uh, when we started, uh, we, we didn't start working, applying this approach on uh, a relatively uh, new or unknown or unexplored area. Uh, we started working in an area that we, uh, I mean, the same research group, explored for a long time. and. Um, that here, I mean, we thought uh, that um, more or less traditional approach uh, and traditional method uh, reach a sort of saturation point. So we couldn't find uh, any real uh, uh, new evidence uh, uh, applying the same methodology. So uh, uh, the, the parallel between what we saw previously and what we can see now um, should be considered under this umbrella. So, well, here you see the major settlement, the Ayali that I talked about uh, previously, the medieval mound, and, uh, well, some uh, other enclosure uh, in the same area, the uh, road system, and, of course, Palo River baths and field systems, too. Well, this is the um the mound i told you and uh, here you see some uh, uh work we did during uh, test excavations as you can see my my team is small but very efficient and here you see um, another in interesting um uh, evidence that came out from um from test excavation so this brown layer is um, um, is a soil, is an agricultural soil, is an agricultural layer. And it's very, very interesting to see this shape that um, I suppose probably uh, is pretty common in your area. Uh, region Faro are pretty common in your area, I think. Um, but totally unknown in uh, in our area. And this is probably something that could be connected to, um, from a certain point of view, to the, uh, is, is the same, what I mean is the same process, is the same kind of issue connected with mounds. So mounds is a typical kind of settlement that um, different culture uh, used uh, in, uh, 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 when they have to uh, to settle or to manage uh, uh, lowland, and the same is region Faro. So if if you have uh, uh, issues connected with lowland and uh, managing water, uh, region Faro can be uh, a very good solution uh, to apply. But this was uh, unknown in, uh, uh, in in our area and uh, generally speaking in Italy. So. That's another interesting uh, uh, evidence of something that were, we were missing in, in, in the past. Uh, well, here's some other evidence. This, this site was a bit, um, um, was not that well conserved, but in any case, uh, uh, we found uh, uh, some interesting evidence here again, some, also some goods connected with uh, uh, the, the, the overall quality of, of, the, of the site and the occupation. And this is the, the last year um, uh, test excavation activity we, we implemented. So in this case, we were interested to, to focus on the uh, field system <coughs> and to better understand if this field system was connected to the medieval mound or was connected to the Roman villa. Um, let's say some 
uh, some 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 evidence connected with the size of the parcels and so on lets us know that this was probably connected with the Roman villa, but before excavating, we uh, didn't get any um, um, any evidence that was good enough. I mean, to to maintain this idea. Um, however, we we started uh, our excavation. We found uh, uh, field boundaries, and uh, uh, here you can see uh, the kind of evidence that was. Uh, possible to recognize. This is pretty uh, clear. And uh, uh, here again, should be uh, pretty easy to, to recognize. Um, and uh, well, we were also pretty lucky because we found some pottery evidence that uh, date uh the uh, the channels and uh, uh, the field system to the roman times uh so uh, we don't we and we didn't find any evidence of and and any connection at least up to now with uh, the medieval times so uh now let's go back to uh, what I told you when uh, uh, I was telling you uh, at the beginning when I was talking about the process that brought us to um, uh, to develop, let's say, this approach. Um, I told you that um, a big issue of gaps between evidence was that we didn't have uh, uh, physical relationships. Uh, well, here you see uh, the, the map uh, of uh, uh, the overall map uh, of the activity of the, the, the the prospection that we did in this area. And you see all the uh, red circles uh, are emphasizing that uh, there are lots of potential physical relationship between uh, features. So all those features are, it's possible to explore them. Not all of them, of course, I mean, this is, this is not the sense. I mean, the sense is to typologize uh, the evidence, typologize the uh, physical relationship, the potential physical relationship, and then uh, to do very targeted test excavation. And uh, that uh, may allow us to uh, find physical relationships. Um, physical relationships may allow us to do that, for instance, to uh, associate different evidence, different typology of evidence to different periods. And going into the detail, for instance, uh, we are back to the era that we were just talking about. Uh, you see, it's possible to identify what belong, uh, so which piece of landscape, which evidence belong to the Roman, Etruscan, late Roman and uh, medieval period. Um, so, what happened here? So it happens that we can finally uh, apply the uh, methodological approach that we apply on our excavation to the landscape. Uh, it's exactly what we do when uh, we are excavating. We are looking for physical relationships. We are looking for um, understanding, uh, of course, I mean, the function of the evidence, the chronology of the evidence, and then we, we are going to put everything together and uh, 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 building uh, uh, significates, meanings. Um, so, well, generally speaking, this area is, uh, um, uh, the area I talk you about is uh, an area that is uh, extremely rich in, in evidence. Uh, and I mean, we, we, we were particularly interested to explore this area also for those reasons, because is we have uh, first a very important Roman and Etruscan city, and then uh, the the city has been abandoned and moved to Grosseto. But this moving was uh, very complicated and absolutely not linear. So we have evidence uh, 
here in Moscona, we have uh, evidence in Mosconcino, where there is, for instance, a very, very big church, the second in size in Tuscany. Um, and uh, then we have this area where uh, lots of uh, evidence has been collected. You, see, you remember, I mean, the field system, the mound, and uh, um, the mound and, uh, and the, the settlement was uh, roughly one hectare, almost two hectares, so a big settlement, and also uh, reclaiming and uh, managing uh, lowland means uh, that you need uh, uh, a very good organization of the work and of, generally speaking, of the society, and lots of investment. So is, uh, is providing us, what I mean, lots of, uh, 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 lots of information. And the same happens in the Ayali area, where we got another mound, other occupation, and, and so on. So, um, um, I, I tell you this because uh, uh, all those work uh, show it from the one end that um, also if you spend decades uh, applying field walking and applying a traditional approach to a landscape, uh, it's possible to miss a very, very large part of the information that is still there. Um, and uh, this approach allowed us to, uh, to fill a lot, a lot of gaps uh, that from the one end are, is, is improving um, our, uh, our picture from the point of view of the quantity of sites. So, um, consider that when we started uh, within uh, the sample uh, that we worked, uh, we got around 80 sites. Uh, now uh, we uh, uh, identified roughly 3,000 evidence. So the uh, 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 the I mean, is is not that easy to compare sites with features, but in any case, uh, um, the improvement from the point of view of the quantity is very very important. But what is more important from my point of view is that the quality of the information has improved substantially. Uh, the quality of the information means that we so we, 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 we are capable now to see evidence that were totally invisible in the past, which means uh, um, opening up new historical problems, opening up new uh, uh, hypotheses uh, and new uh, research questions. Um, moreover, there is also an issue from the point of view of the conservation. So, if we don't know that the site or that the evidence is there, there is no opportunity to conserve anything. So, the landscape, the landscape is going to be transformed and destroyed. Um, now, uh, as I wrote uh, uh, on my abstract that I send you, what is really important to understand is that we are um, I mean, a revolution is, is happening, is not going to happen, is happening. Because uh, uh, here you see some, uh, some uh, instrument and system that allow to collect very large areas uh, in a day of magnetic uh, GPR or uh, um, ERT data. And uh, so uh, that means that we, we absolutely need to, uh, to move from, uh, I mean, traditional and uh, anachronistic, I would also say, approach to the study of landscapes uh, to uh, the present one. So, to, uh, um, to an approach that allow us to use at best uh, what uh, I mean, the, the the market and the technology is offering us. I mean, we 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 can think to um, uh, uh, to work as it was. I mean, uh, uh, possible to work in the, in the past. We have to live in the contemporaneity, and we live and and we have to convince, of course, uh, with uh, with with going to allow us to do that. Uh, which means, I mean. Uh, with, uh, uh, with the money also to, to, to buy those systems, uh, to, uh, that is definitely important, I mean, to start 
uh, working in this direction. And uh, yeah, well, as last uh, uh, thought, I, I, I would uh, give you this advice. I mean, I think is it's not that important. I mean, it's not a matter of method. It's not a matter of, uh, uh, and sometimes it's, not, it's, it's also not a matter of questions. Um, what I would advise all of you is uh, to try to be, uh, uh, not to be reactive, let's say, not to be, uh, uh, not to have a, a reactive approach, but to, uh, to focus your attention and to try always to be proactive uh, against, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, the, any kind of traditional approach or against any kind of problem, any kind of issue. So if there is a problem, if there is woodland, think about how it's possible to overcome woodland and how it's possible to, uh, to look through. Or if uh, your evidence or what you are looking for is very difficult, I mean, to be identified. I mean, your, um, your, your duty is also, I mean, to be critical and think about how it's possible to overcome these kind of issues and then to answer your questions. Um, I think it's fine. I think it's I'm over. So here, here you can find on uh, um, emptyscapes.org. You can find all the details of the project. Uh, and uh, of course, I didn't that uh, alone. Uh, there is a team that is working with me. And uh, here you see uh, the guys. This is the guy that collected uh, 850 uh, uh, hectares of magnetic and cyto and uh, all the others that uh, helped me and uh, um, participate to field work. Uh, and dear two very good friends, uh, Dominic Polis and who first, I didn't tell you this, but who first uh, uh, implemented the approach of uh, um, very large scale and continuous geophysical prospection and, uh, and Chris Masson. That's it, thank you very much for your attention. Um, question time, of course. Thank you very much, Stefano, for your presentation. Uh, I would have a question if, uh, for the, <clears throat> to start with. You said that uh, at the Roman villa, that uh, aerial photography is not always working. Yeah, it's not always working, but for that Roman villa, did you try? another uh, sensor to use to see if with another sensor you can see the crop marks, for example, thermo camera or something like that? Yeah, well, this is, this is, uh, um, this is possible. No, we didn't because uh, when, we, when we did um, the survey was 2005 and then 2007. <coughs> and at the time, thermo sensor were, uh, well, not exactly available or not that easy. I mean, to um, to to have now now sh now it's possible. Now we have drones with uh, with uh, multispectral cameras, and uh, yeah, that could be possible. You know, I'm um, for instance, I'm now working with um, a PhD student who is uh, uh, testing term. Multi, multi spectral cameras on drones and um, the what i think is that is is very promising is very interesting but what we need uh, from this side is uh, um, well documented studies so because you know the the problem is that there are some papers and uh, some experience showing that uh, multispectral works but we know that it works. Uh, the problem is we, what we need to know is uh, what we need uh, is uh, to get more information to better understand when it works, uh, when it doesn't work, why it doesn't work. So that allow us not just to, to say, well, let's try, uh, but as it happened with uh, traditional uh, cameras and uh, aerial photography, for instance, we know that maybe we uh, we can see maybe not it depends from the here and this is not predictable easily but we know exactly for instance 
when the time window is the proper one. So we know that if uh, I don't, uh, for instance, if if we go, uh, if we fly uh, after uh, uh, the, the the crop has been harvested, we can't see anything. Or uh, if we uh, go there when everything is green and uh, uh, crop has to uh, to get mature, uh, we don't, we can see anything. Uh, in, in most of cases. So what we need is to get more information on uh, how to use uh, this kind of remote sensing, which can be very, very interesting, absolutely. Uh, because, you know, I mean, aerial photography is amazing. Uh, with uh, just taking a picture, I mean, just the time of taking a picture, you can, uh, you can get uh, the information that you need, for instance, uh, hours or days i mean to collect uh, magnetic or ERT data so uh, when it works is amazing but we need to better understand when and why okay thank you uh, uh, any other questions no one well i have a question uh somehow related to what uh, Ovidio asked um but are landsat images useful for this kind of uh, uh problem that you are talking about with that um with that kind of uh, archaeological site i mean with a uh band color analysis help understand indirectly so to speak the landscape and then to with uh, uh, analysis of those um, images to have an idea of what might happen there in, in uh, during various stages of uh, vegetation or something like that. I mean, if satellite images could be of any help for, in this kind of context. Uh, well, I. I yeah, well, I didn't talk about, uh, I just said at a certain point that we, we used and that we could see something uh, in the case of the Ayali. Um, you know, I uh, immediately after my degree, I started my PhD, which was based on satellite imagery. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I mean, when, when, I, when I started my PhD, Iconos imagery, I mean, the first Iconos imagery were, were available. So, um, the, but the resolution was not good enough. And I think that also now the resolution is not good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, it, that, that that can be 30 centimeter in some cases, uh, but of course, I mean, it's panchromatic, so it's not that exciting because it's black and white. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I used recently, I use a lot satellite imagery, but I used in uh, in other contexts, for instance, in Iraq, where we are running some projects. So what I mean is, uh, uh, if you have access to uh, drone, to uh, aerial photography, uh, if you can do geophysics, uh, if you can do field work, um, in my experience, uh, I don't think that satellite imagery can be uh, particularly helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, in the case of, of Iraq, as you can ex as you can imagine, uh, above all during the ISIS occupation, Daesh occupation, uh, it wasn't possible to go there or to do any uh, yeah. any kind of uh, field work or to check. I mean, uh, uh, anything. So. Uh, and so this was the only resource that we could use. Uh, uh, but for instance, when we went there, uh, we did drone survey, we did field work. Uh, and uh, I mean, if, if, if it's possible, and, and another, another point is, is the scale. Because of course, if you have to survey, uh, or if, you, if, if your interests are based on a very large survey, if you're interested yeah. to study Italy, <laughs> or, <laughs> Or, or Romania, of course, satellite mm -hmm. imagery can be um, a good uh, approach or uh, of some value. Uh, but if you're working on a limited area and uh, you are looking for relatively small evidence, uh, satellite imagery are 
not that good because a resolution is not good enough and um, also expensive uh, pretty expensive yeah so it, it very much depends on the context and on the absolute questions that you have that everyone anyone yeah. has yeah, yeah 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 that's true and then on the scale that you're interested to uh, one is interested to analyze to research yeah yeah so totally agree but it's interesting that now with all these during the last 20, 20 years with all the uh, concepts and methods that have been developed, it's now it's now possible to have a better um, correlation between this kind of analysis of remote sensing and, uh, uh, for example, when we want to try to understand more about the environment and the climate, to correlate those uh, results with uh, um, climatic simulation models like atmospheric research like the trace 21 data models or like uh, modis and um, other resources that can be now correlated and have a better picture about what um, what happened with the yeah. environment and what is happening even now with the environment with this and on the future to make better predictions about the present and the and the future yeah, that's true. I, I think that what we need is to, uh, I mean, to, to 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 implement opportunity to work together, uh, because maybe working together is possible to develop also uh, maps. Uh, I would say that may uh, uh, help us to understand each other uh, results and data sets, and maybe also integrate data sets. Um, but yeah, I mean, as um, as I was telling at the beginning, I mean, we uh, we focused mainly on on pollen analysis and uh, uh, and paleopathology, but bioarchaeology is uh, is is extremely wide and uh, uh, plenty of opportunity to answer questions. Uh, is um, yeah uh, super interesting. Thank Any you. other question? Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Sorry. No one? Okay. There were any questions? No. Okay, if there's no other questions, then I can think that we can end this uh, uh, conference and let's hope that next year we can see each other face to face at the, our university with, when the, this crisis with the pandemic is over. Thank you very much for your presentation, Stefano. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, attending the uh, conference. Uh, until next time, what can I say? Uh, I hope everyone will understand the presentation and everything is okay. Uh, well, just, in, just in case there is a registration, they wanted to thank you, of course, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, thanks yeah. again. It was my pleasure. So the presentation will be up on... Uh... The presentation will be up on YouTube or on uh, Instagram? Yeah, or? we want to uh, upload the presentation on YouTube and uh, on Archaeoscience uh, page of Facebook uh, after yeah, yeah. you already send it to me. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. It will have a larger audience. Uh, yeah, 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 I hope so. <laughs> okay, so. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. And I hope to. Uh, to come visiting you as soon as possible. Yeah, we hope that too. We want to make, uh, like I said, like we talk about, we want to make a uh, field workshop to go on the field with a drone and see what we can do with it there. Yeah. Let's hope that next year is going to be better.
Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. And okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.